She was born in Milan, she studied in Padova, and then did her master's in Barcelona, and then the PhD in Roskilde University. So she's been moving around quite a bit. Then she established in Brazil, I don't know why, or you can explain at some point. And, and she won the L'Oreal Prize, L'Oreal Prize for Women in Science in 2018, and she just won the, uh, a prize by the uh, Sociedad Brasileira de Matemática. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have Luna here. She's going to talk a little bit about her life, and then a little bit about what she studies, which is mostly about Mandelbrot set, which is a very famous fractal thing. Thank you. Thank you, Silvina. Can you hear me? So. It's not on. Now you can hear me better. Ah, yes. Now I can hear me better. Opa. I'm not very technological, as you can <laughs> just realize. But yeah, I, if somebody told me when I started in 2004 that after 15 years I would end up here, invited speaking in an event for women in STEM, uh, for explaining about my path, I would have laughed very, 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 very much. My path was everything but smooth. I thought about quitting uh, uncountably many times. Uh, last time was after winning the position at USP. I'm a I'm professor of mathematics at IMI USP. And yeah, um, why did you think of quitting? I thought of quitting because I was feeling a fraud. I felt a fraud for most of my career. I, my family is not a family of scientists. My mom was a middle school teacher. Uh, my father was a hairdresser. This is probably why I have this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, he was born very, very, very poor in the south of Italy. And uh, I mean, he didn't. He did high school uh, when after he retired, uh, and he graduated at the uh, university in philosophy last November. <laughs> so I was the first one in my family at getting a degree. Uh, and uh, I got a degree in math because of philosophical reasons. I, I always liked math, but in Italy, when you choose for high school, you can choose, well, there are the liceo, that are the highest class studying, whatever you want to call it. Then there are technical studies, and then there are professional studies. And in the liceo, there are the classical, where you study a lot of Greek, Latin, philosophy, history, and this kind of stuff. Science where you study science, and linguistic, where you study languages. And I went into the classical one. So I studied a lot of Greek, Latin, and philosophy. I loved philosophy. Philosophy was my, my favorite subject. But there was something that I was annoyed about philosophy, and it's the fact that every time you study a new philosopher, he needs to kill everybody who came before him. <laughs> and he starts from scratch. I mean, you go to read Kant, the spirit, and then you go to read Hegel, the spirit. Is the same spirit word, right? <laughs> no, completely different meaning. You have to start the vocabulary again. And they all kind of know the previous one was stupid because of this and this and this and this. I got the solution of everything. And it felt, you know, kind of, mm, when mathematics, from a philosophical perspective, I had no idea of what I was signing up for. Mathematics was feeling more human in some sense. I mean, when Gauss and Klein and Franz started speaking about non-Euclidean geometry, I mean, some parallel lines can intersect. 
They didn't say Euclid was an idiot. <laughs> they were something like, no, he was a genius. And with this, we do some kind of geometry, but we can do something else. I mean, it's kind of, to me, math was some kind of a human progress altogether for going to some kind of truth, to some philosophical uh, episteme. And uh, I mean, I, I, I was 17 years old, 18 years old. <laughs> it was my vision of the world, right? And, uh, and then I, I was thinking also that Either the world, was, uh, the world was written in mathematical characters, a la Galileo. So I mean, it made sense to understand the world to study mathematics. Or at least our brain is written in mathematical terms. Because I mean, we understand everything through logic, right? I mean, uh, well, I mean, uh, I'm not sure I have to say this in a room full of physicists, but I mean, physics is a compromise within, between math and the real world, right? I mean, it's kind of, of like, you try to understand the world. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, I, I apologize from the beginning, but I mean, from my romantic vision of, uh, so I thought in both cases, it's very much worth it to spend time in learning math. And with this wonderful uh, philosophical idea, I entered the, the University of Mathematics of Padova. And I found uh, integrals and matrices. My god, first time I saw a matrix was something like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I found the uh, Professors that weren't the best professor, let's put it that way. <laughs> I mean, I remember when they presented me a matrix, it was something like, yeah, this is a matrix. Uh, let's, uh, let's start uh, with uh, something that is expansion or so identity multiplied by some constant. Second example, rotation matrix, uh, sinus and cosinus, and uh, you rotate. Third example, one, 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 minus one, Minkowski matrix, future. Past, present. <laughs> <laughs> what are we speaking about? <laughs> and I was going asking. At that time, I was going asking uh, a lot. So I'm like, uh, in Italy, it's very, very, very formal. And I'm like, excuse me, wonderful, uh, magnificent <laughs> professor. Could you explain me what <laughs> is this thing? And he was speaking, OK. This is uh, um, a linear application from the corp of, uh, where, from the field of whatever and the field of whatever. OK, again, could you explain? This is a linear application. I was like, huh? <laughs> After I was like, why didn't you use the term function? But yeah, whatever. Um, and I was always, always, always received with this, you know, this contempt look kind of, are you really that stupid that you don't get it? Yeah. And you know, you go asking once, twice, three times. I remember one, the, this stuck in my head. It was the first partial of linear algebra. So what we had to do was find the determinants of this, you know, 55 times 55 matrices. It's the festival of the computation that you have to do all this. Uh, yeah. And uh, at uh, that test, uh, I got half past four. That was enough for going to the second uh, test, uh, but it wasn't sufficient anyway. I took my test, uh, and I saw a lot of um, mistakes of calculus, you know, something like a two, two plus two is five, but it seemed to me that the algorithm was correct. And it's not the same not having understand anything or having to be more focused at the moment of doing two plus two. So I went to the professor, kind of genuflecting, magnificent professor, could you please uh, tell me whether this is, my intuition is right. I mean, is the, the algorithm right and the most of the mistakes, calculus mistakes? And the guy looks at me like that. If the signorina, if the lady won a degree in mathematics, at least 
the four fundamental operations must be known how to do. And he went away. I was like, yeah. So the most of the mistakes were calculus, right? It wasn't a great feeling. <laughs> Uh, the second test, uh, I passed. I went uh, to get uh, the, the oral examination because there was a written uh, examination and oral or examination. And at the oral or examination, well, let's say that I didn't do the best of my figures ever. I didn't understand that much. Also because they didn't explain that much, but this is another story. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, at a certain point, the, the professor looks at me and say, 18. In Italy, you put, 18 is the bare minimum. Uh, the mark goes till 30. And yeah, 18 is something like five and thank me. But you can refuse the mark. That is something like I come back and I do it another time. And he was something like, 18. And I look at him. I refuse it. He looks at me and he smashed the head on the... Um, on the desk like that, <laughs> <laughs> Look at me, something like, really? Lady? Let's save it in a drawer or somewhere and you can't refuse it like this. And I'm like, I refuse it. Let's put it in a drawer. I refuse it. Let's put it in a drawer. I refuse it. And <laughs> after a while of this was something like, yeah, put it wherever you want. I didn't put it with these words, but it's something like, yeah, in January, I will come back. I came back in January and when he, saw me taking the test, it was something like, <laughs> 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 I did so a ghost. <laughs> and then when I did the oral examination and I got 24, which is not 30, but I mean, it's much better than 18. He was at me like, 24? That's a good mark. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I was at the point to tell me, yeah, I'm not completely stupid, you know, my friend. <laughs> But the point is that these things pile up. You don't even realize it, but they pile up. The contempt, contempt is a look. It's kind of with all the um, desprezo. How do you say it in, in English? It piles up. And reach the moment in which you just convince yourself that you're just not worth it. That. And you're just not worth it. And why should I? Waste the precious oxygen in the <laughs> in a math uh, building uh, while there are other people that are much 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 worth it at this than me. Actually, I got convinced of that, and but then it happens that I love traveling and I got an Erasmus scholarship for going to Barcelona to spend one year in Barcelona. And it was something like, wow. I go to Barcelona, I will finish it fast, and then I will find a job, I mean, in a bank, in insurance, in whatever. When I arrived in Barcelona, it was kind of shocking, because, I mean, the professors were answering my questions. And I was like, wow! <laughs> <laughs> my marks doubled, kind of. And I was like, yeah, I didn't become a genius. It's just I was treated in a different way. And then I decided to stay in Barcelona. I did my master in Barcelona. But my master was completely professional. I mean, I did a lot of stochastic processes, the finance, and all these kind of things, because I was sure that it wasn't worth it for research. I would go to work. I mean, not that the research is not a work in this <laughs> particular moment. <laughs> it's very important to repeat it. <laughs> but I mean, I'm speaking about a nine to five job, where you actually have holidays and weekends. Um, and then what happened? It happened that I was uh, um, working in a restaurant in order to pay the bills, and I had a friend of mine, that a French guy at the same master program, that got a scholarship in some Marie Curie network, super fancy, for starting the PhD in dynamical C. <laughs> and then it happened that the guy got um, a position as teacher for the Liceo Francais in Barcelona. And the guy made a couple of computations with the salaries. It was something like, why should they do a PhD while I have my permanent job? I take this. I don't want the scholarship anymore. 
And he came to me and he was something like, Luna, there is this professor in the dynamical system desperate to find somebody to get this position filled, and it pays well. I looked at the salary, it was something like, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> The following day, I put the alarm clock because, I mean, I was working at the restaurant, so, I mean, usually I would have woken up kind of late, but put the alarm clock for arriving at the professor's office at reasonable time, like 11. I was something like, I love dynamical systems. I would <laughs> love to do a career in this. And she looked at me and something like, do you know what a dynamical system is? No, but I already love it. <laughs> I'm sure it's better than the restaurant where I, where I work or so whatever. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, like, okay, don't worry, do my course. And then uh, we speak about it. And I did the course. And uh, honestly, I was doing stochastic processes at the same time, and I was feeling much more confident in stochastic process. There was a friend of mine at that time, and we were studying together. I was doing the homework in stochastic processes, and she was doing the homework in dynamical system. I ended up doing a PhD in dynamical system, and she did a PhD in stochastic process. <laughs> like. <laughs> but yeah. Um, then it happened that I could then take that scholarship in Barcelona, because I stayed in Barcelona too much time. I, Marie Curie has a weird uh, movement uh, requirement. And so I ended up in Denmark. And I didn't even know English. <laughs> I mean, I arrived in Denmark. And I didn't really know a lot of math because in the first two years uh, in Padova, they were speaking with definition and not answering questions. Now that I'm on the other side, I realize why they do it. It's much less work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, explaining. It takes a lot of effort. It's much easier just <laughs> copying the book, speaking a definition, and look with contempt if somebody asks you a question, something like, are you that stupid that you can't figure it yourself, basically? You have much less work. But yeah, um, the result was that, I mean, a lot of basic stuff I didn't understand. And uh, then when I arrived in Barcelona, I was convinced that I would go into finance or whatever. So I mean, I studied in my master a lot of applied stuff, not real math. So I started my PhD <laughs> knowing very little. And well, my, um, my PhD advisor was wonderful, Karsten Peterson. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here at this moment. He was always there for answering everything. And uh, every now and then offering the shoulder for me crying because I'm like, no, I don't understand anything. I'm a fraud. It's better if I change my career. During my PhD, I thought it an insane amount of time because, I mean, during the, P the PhD is that moment in which you have a lot of time to think. And think is, is dangerous <laughs> when I it right. <laughs> I mean, you're there with a lot of time for solving a problem and you start wondering, but do I like doing this, <laughs> you know? And actually, I do like it, but I was feeling extremely insecure because I didn't know a lot of things. A friend of mine told me that, yeah, the PhD is the moment in which you learn to play a game. But I didn't know the rules of the game, <laughs> you know, <laughs> somehow. And somehow I managed to finish my PhD. I managed to fill the important gaps there. I wrote a thesis. Uh, then after that, it was the years of austerity in Europe. So even if my thesis was kind of nice, um, it was the moment in which there were no money. No money. And the first thing that usually they cut in a crisis is money for research, which is very easy to do. Uh, but it gives problems in a long term. But yeah, this is another pair of hands. But yeah, the point is that there were no money. So I was searching a postdoc, and uh, there was a lot of competition because the same Marie Curie grant I took, other people took. So I mean, there were an a lot of people with a PhD in dynamical system um, in a higher part of the career of me. And this was another moment in which you start thinking, yeah, I'm really not worth it because I finished it. I can't find a job. I ended up in China. 
and I loved it. But I mean, it's some, for me, it was kind of weird because I mean, I had to leave not just Italy, Europe. And in China, on the other hand, it was wonderful. I kind of found a place where there wasn't, there weren't pre-confectioned idea about how your path should be, or maybe they weren't, but I'm just not understanding Chinese people <laughs> enough. So I mean, for me, it was completely free territory. It was kind of blank. I could do whatever. And then I started building myself. I started filling all the holes that I knew that I had. And I started liking it a lot. But I was sure that it was late. I, I remember telling to friends of mine, yeah, I mean, the, the train passed. I mean, it, I can't learn now things that I should have learned 10 years ago. But somehow, I ended up in Brazil with another postdoc. I inscribed to, I signed up for the concurso at USP. Somehow I passed it. And <laughs> My first years of teaching at USP were exactly the graduation courses I needed. <laughs> of nonchalance. And now I feel stronger. I feel much more on my feet. Still, I feel a fraud every now and then. Because depending on the room you are, depending on the position you are, I mean, in my department, there are more men called Pedro than women. <laughs> Let's speak about this. I'm usually, I'm so used to be the only woman in a room that it starts feeling weird seeing the other ones. You know, it's not like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and uh, sometimes, because it happens, a, a part of you starts thinking about competing with that one woman, woman more than with the others, because it's not like if there is one spot, I want it to be my spot. <laughs> Instead of fighting together for creating two spots. This is something that happens a lot. And it's very dangerous. But yeah. Uh, somehow I'm kind of rethinking on my path lately. Uh, I started looking at my trajectory with different eyes, thinking, yeah, maybe this thing of machism really made a difference at the beginning. And when you start learn, I mean, the years in which you start learning something are very important for the confidence you have in such a subject. And it takes a hell of a time healing, just healing. And yeah, this is why I'm here, because it's something like if I can share my story and tell to other person, if you feel stupid, don't worry, I've been there. <laughs> Uh, just don't believe it. Just believe in yourself. If they want you to feel stupid, don't believe it. It's very easy to say. <laughs> <laughs> Doing it in an, is another pair of hands, and uh, it's something I'm currently working with my analyst. <laughs> I mean, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot. But I think it's important to start sharing this experience and say, yeah, there is some kind of resilience of society on, we are all kind of, inertia is a very powerful force in, in the world. I, again, sorry for the physicist when I speak about this kind of thing. <laughs> but yeah, and even for starting is difficult because the good scientist has some kind of qualities, requires some kind of qualities that society do not see well in women. Because I mean, it's true you have to be intelligent and you have to be curious. Well, already a woman curious not, is not necessarily always well seen, but you need to be selfish. You need to be workaholic. You need to be a bit arrogant for standing where you, where you stand. A bit of skepticism, competitive. And usually these are, I mean, a lot of mentalities would like women to be nice at, at their place, like if society knew our place better than ourselves, and with behaving in an opposite way as a scientist. So it takes, it takes force. 
It takes confidence. And it takes us started speaking together about all these kind of problems because for realizing that we're not alone. You and you and you and you are leading exactly the same things as, as me. And you feel less like, a, I don't know, completely isolated and very weak uh, weirdo in, in a place that it's not supposed to be yours. It's supposed to be yours. We just need to believe in it. Yeah, and this is about my... Opa. I'm really not technological. I <laughs> showed it before. <laughs> Ah, yeah, 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 of course. Well, I mean, they, they told me to do half, more or less half of the history of my life and half of the, more or less, my results, uh, the Mandelbrot set. Uh, so this was the half about the story of my life. But if there are questions, I can speak all my life about the story of my life for obvious reasons. <laughs> it's a subject I know pretty well. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Luna, thank you very much for sharing this because I'm experiencing this right now with my um, master degree, and I um, I had a lot of problems with my my program um, racism and and I um, I I always uh, think that. For me, the first violence that I, I faced, it was the symbolic one. Um, when I got to my program, for instance, I I study in a place. Well, I'm a journalist, but I, I'm 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 studying history of science in a place at um, really. Uh, they study computer science, and sometimes I attend some classes at um, the, at the technical center of the UFRJ. And um, I think it's for me the first uh, very fierce violence was the not seeing me as an icon in anywhere. And I and well, um, it's uh, it really um, draws my um, my forces all the time. And uh, and you, when you shared your story, you made everything I think lighter to me. And Thanks. I. I thank you very much. <laughs> I, I don't know, it's it's not the question, but I'm really happy that you um, that you can show um, a side that I I know that is very difficult for us um, in esteem in research. You are not allowed to do that. So thank you very much. Another question? So, minutinho, como se diz. Firstly, I need to say you are a show woman. This moment <laughs> was amazing. <laughs> Secondly, I want to ask you do you still feel like a fraud yeah. sometimes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like most of the time? or No, it's. Uh, well, I mean, winning pro the, the, the nice thing about winning prizes is that, I mean, they give you confidence. It's not like, well, I mean, if somebody else gave me a prize, uh, it means that they like my work, right? And I remember, um, but I mean, even after winning the, the Concurso at USP, that was probably the most fraudulent moment, I mean, fraudulent thinking uh, moment of my life in the sense that, I mean, I knew very well what I didn't know, and I had to explain it to Kate. <laughs> you know? It was something like, how am I going to explain something that I don't understand? Well, and then I realized that, I mean, understanding is not a zero-one 
thing. I mean, understanding is a spectrum. I mean, and more you understand something, and every time you look at something, you understand it better, and you realize that the previous time you didn't understand it. So I mean, uh, but yeah, I was really, 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 really in crisis the first year after I, I got into USP. Still that a friend of mine, uh, he's a um, UF Rejota, he's a Ian Isoli, looked at me and was something like, Luna, stop being so arrogant. If a commission of the concurso chose you as the best candidate, just believe them. <laughs> <laughs> that was something like, you know what, Isa? You're right. I took the advice. <laughs> <laughs> and I started feeling a bit better. But still, I mean, it happens a lot of time that, I mean, there are also situations in which it's very clear that they want you to feel a fraud. So now it starts at the moment in which, well, I mean, after 15 years of it, you know what? Uh, I resist. But it's, an ongoing process, uh, and it's definitely not uh, solved at all. Just going better and better and better, and I hope that it ain't. <laughs> Is there any other questions, comments? Thank you for sharing your life with us. So I was always, always thinking that women feel much more insecure than men all the time. But my main question in this point is why it's so bad to don't know things? And I I'm keep asking to myself, why it's so bad that I, can, I don't know something? Why I feel so bad with this? And I don't know what you feel like. Why you just, we just feel so... We can, can't deal with this. I don't know if... You understand. <laughs> well, I mean, you are, by default, we are afraid of what we don't understand. So, math somehow is threatening because it's complicated. And it has another thing. It's perfect. And we are not. And here is a cause of a lot of existential problems. But... If they look at you as you can understand it, you do understand it. I'm sure that you understand it. Your chances to understand something are kind of exponentially higher than if they look at you and say, you will never understand it. I mean, what the hell are you doing here? Um, and this builds up. And our, our, to me, I, I, I cannot answer for everybody, but I mean, to me, it reached the point in which it was kind of suffocating. And you look something and you don't understand the definition, and you start feeling kind of panicking. And yeah, breathe in, breathe out, go to, you, you have a walk and you find a way of going around it. But I mean, it happens. And I think it happens more with women, not because women are more stupid than men, but because Society thinks that STEM is for men. So a lot of people in the people outside departments and in departments, when they look at you, it sounds like, what are you doing here? Either you're perfect and then you can justif justify that you're there, or you will be questioned much more than a man. And this builds up. And you end up feeling more insecure, but not because you know less. completely agree with you. So if you treat me like I'm stupid, I will feel like I'm stupid and, and I cannot, I will not deal with the thing, but uh, I'm just trying to to learn a little bit more about how we, why we are more prone, propensed, I don't know, to feel this insecurity. So to, if someone just say to a man that he's stupid, he will just say, you are stupid, I'm not stupid. So I don't, I don't you, think that we are more propensed. I think that it's building up. I mean, after, I don't know how old are you, I'm 34, and after 34 years of hearing the same, you build it up. So, I mean, you're much more 
susceptible, how you say it in English, susceptible to react to it than somebody that always everybody told him, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great. If you do a mistake, you think, well, I mean, probably it's because of the other people's fault, it's not my fault because I'm great. This is what I think. And this comes with, it starts with the kindergarten. I mean, we give to baby girls uh, the dolls and the little kitchens, and we give to the baby boys uh, the airplanes and the trains and Lego and all this kind of stuff. I mean, what's the message? Yeah. When I was at the um, L'Oreal premiation ceremony, whatever, last year, there was, I don't remember who, um, of the guy who were giving the, the prizes, that say that he just had a niece and he wanted to give her a present, uh, this thing of the little chemist, uh, this, I mean, there are these boxes in which you do all your stuff, and he went uh, to searching in a baby shop. And he searched, he searched, he searched, and then he asked it to the, uh, the seller, where is this, I can't find it. And the person looked at him and was like, you're in the wrong section, this is for boys. You are in the section for girls. I mean, it starts at kindergarten. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> we have like five minutes. I don't know if you want to say something in five minutes or you want to keep on with the uh, question. Whatever. If you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you want to see slides, I'm happy to show them. It's So it's up to you. I'm not sure it makes a lot of time to speak about the number set in five minutes. But I can say what it is if you're, it depends. To me it's. Are there any questions? More? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> tell, tell me like you're telling in the elevator, what he, was the discovery that he made that gave you the L'Oreal prize, yeah. you understand? Like an elevator talent. Uh, well, I mean, there's something about the geometry of the Mandelbrot set. There is a famous fractal that is called the Mandelbrot set and is famous for technical reasons because it describes a family of polynomials and even if you can think of polynomials is not the easiest thing in the world for some part of mathematics, it is. And the Mandelbrot set is, has self-similarity. There are copies of him into himself. Something from here or not? Oh, yeah. You can, you can move from with this, you go. Remember, elevator. Elevator. <laughs> so I studied this set. Um, and the thing about this set that I'm interested in is the fact that you can find copies of this set into this set. If you zoom here, you see this. And this looks exactly like this without the, this cusp. Mm -hmm. And if you zoom again, if you have a good enough computer, you zoom here, and you see this. And this actually looks exactly like this guy and even has the cusp. Mm -hmm. So you start wondering how these things, these things are the same in mathematical terms is, is there a homeomorphism between uh, the big guy and the small guy? Uh, the answer is yes, both here and there and here and there. And then the second question you can ask is something like, well, now that I know that they are kind of the same, their geometry is going to be the same. So, I mean, if I'm going to look, zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom, you know, the infinitesimal structure, do I see the same? Uh, and this will be, can I find a diffeomorphism? The answer is no, but you can find something that the best, a uh, possible answer is something that is called quasi-conformal, that it's, it's quasi. 
it almost going to be the same geometrical. And uh, it happens that if you have the cusp, I mean, it's very reasonable, right? If you have the cusp, the answer is yes. If you don't have the cusp, the answer is no. Uh, and then you start wondering, OK, but what about all the ones without a cusp? Because if it makes sense, uh, yes, between cusps and no, if you don't, between cusp and no cusp, what about no cusp, no cusp? And it has been believed that the answer was yes for a while, and actually the answer is no, in general. That's what you found. That's what I found. Well, me and my former PhD advisor, Karsten Peterson, uh, that, yeah. And now we are trying to prove that some of these balls actually are. So, the, so far, the answer is, in general, no. But be, we believe that in some cases, yes. And this is taking forever to prove because, well, usually it's easier to find a counterexample that <laughs> then to find some construct that, yes, it works for everything. Is, is it enough elevator? <laughs> a little bit long elevator trip, but <laughs> Still time for another question or comment? Well, I will make one myself. <laughs> How has the prize restructured your interaction with your colleagues, like your supervisor and the other colleagues in the different stages of your career? What? Receiving the prize, Receiving the prize the has impacted Mm, well, I mean, yes, in the sense that, yes and no. In the sense that, I mean, uh, before L'Oreal Prize, I was basically unknown in the math community. Well, I mean, I was known by everybody personally. We were drinking beer together after the conferences and everything. But not known in the sense invited speaker or things like that. I mean, it was in, in, invisible on a scientific level, not a human human level, but scientific level, invisible. After Logo L'Oreal Prize, I start being visible. So they started inviting me, for example. Uh, now, after the SBM Prize, they invited even more. There is some difference, probably. The thing is that I'm trying to not to look at that. I try to... I relate myself with other people in the same way I did before. Yeah, I got a couple of prizes. Fair enough. Uh, there, I noticed that there is some politics going on and para papa, but I try to <laughs> avoid it because it, um, I do it because I find it nice, and I I stayed in I stayed in math after all. Um, disregarding the traumatizing starting point because uh, sounds weird <laughs> possibly, but I mean I really liked the um, environment. I liked the relate relating me with open-minded people that are very um, scientific honest and all of this. And I don't want this to be mixed up with, uh, yeah, I want a prize more than you, you want a prize more than me, and I don't know, I find it a bit sad. So I'm trying to avoid, but yeah, you, you feel some pressure. <laughs> I, 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 it was a very confusing answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I think, so if there are no more questions, then we can take the uh, coffee break. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you're going to stay until noon, is that right? Yes. So she's staying until noon, and then she has to go teach at USP. I don't know yes. if now you know what you have to teach or yeah, not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> anyway, so don't forget to sign up for the uh, movie so that we can organize the, the slots. But I think we are not those. Many. We are pretty good, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.